This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Thank you, Laurie, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to Dr. Ford for allowing me to speak today. Um, it's been very exciting having looked through all the previous speakers. Um, I hope I can live up even a little bit um, to expectations. Um, only somebody from the United Kingdom transplanted to northern Minnesota would arrive in Florida, <laughs> where I hear it's been three days of beautiful sun, only to bring dark clouds and rain. <laughs> but still, uh, earlier this week um, in Duluth, we had an inch of snow, so you can still count, yourself, still count yourselves lucky. The snow hasn't arrived here yet. I thank um, Dr. Ford for having shown me around the Institute today, and so I've really gotten to know, to know the place. It's quite an extraordinary place that seems to me like a cross between the Max Planck Institute and Oxbridge College, maybe one of Leonardo da Vinci's old Renaissance workshops, <laughs> and maybe a um, space camp. Or at least for me, space camp in the sense of uh, lots of amazing robots, which I don't quite understand how they work, but it's still very exciting for me. So thank you for having me today. So after I came to the University of Minnesota to Duluth, um, I realized that no existing work synthesizes the science of immunity and autoimmunity in light of historical case studies of nutritional change. And to the research project, um, which led to a book recently published, Decolonizing the Diet, Nutrition, Immunity, and the Warning from Early America, from which part of this um, lecture today derives for the first time I've ever really given this in an extended form. The project provides an entirely different methodological and historical focus than my ongoing work on the intellectual and constitutional history of America. So if anyone wants to talk to me about religion and the American founding, I can, but this is my other strand of my interest. One, one of the interests keeps me kind of sane while doing the other and vice versa. Nicola, who you can see on the left, who is a biologist by training, um, whom I met um, in, uh, when she was working in a laboratory in Cambridge, and we subsequently became something of an item. Um, she co-authored co uh, the book with me. So she's the biologist who did all the hard work, and I'm the historian who takes all the credit. And, there we, and there's the, the cover. Um, so here's a summary of what I'm going to try and cover today. Apologies for text-heavy um, slides that you'll see. I've tried to condense a lot in, into the 45 minutes to 55 minutes, so we're not here until Christmas. So I've gotten rid of a lot of the... The fancier diagrams and pictures, at least that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So we'll have to conjure a lot of these images in, from our mind's eye. Some of them won't necessarily be pleasant images, but they're important images nonetheless to cover. So I'll begin by comparing the European transition from Paleolithic hunting and gathering with Native American subsistence strategies before and after 1492. And now for a new way of understanding the link between biology, ecology, and history, beyond the so-called virgin soil paradigm that a lot of you will have already been familiar with, that Native Americans declined in populations due to immutable genetic differences in their immunity. Synthesizing the latest work in the history of science, in, 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 in nutrition, immunity, and evolutionary genetics with um, the history of indigenous North America, I highlight a fundamental model of demographic destruction. Human populations have been able to recover in generally a century, maybe 150 years. They fail to recover from epidemics, whatever genetic differences may or may not be, when their ability to hunt, gather, or, and or farm nutritionally dense plants and animals is diminished by war, colonization, and cultural destruction. So the history of Native America before and after 1492 clearly shows that biological immunity is not contingent, or at least entirely contingent, um, on immunity, but on historical context, not least in relation to the protection or the destruction of long-evolved nutritional building blocks that underlie human immunity. And so these historical insights provide a framework to approach contemporary health dilemmas, both inside and outside indigenous North America. As we all um, are becoming increasingly familiar, many developed nations now face a so-called medical crisis, where diseases of civilization, as they've increasingly been termed, have been linked to an evolutionary mismatch between our ancient genetic heritage and our present social, nutritional, and ecological environments. Death by food pyramid, you could say. The disastrous European intervention in Native American life after 1492, 
brought about a similar, though of course far more destructive, mismatch between biological needs and societal context. The curtailment of nutritional diversity is related to declining immunity in the face of infectious disease, to diminishing fertility, and to the increasing prevalence of metabolic syndromes that reduce both. And so the lecture intervenes in a series of historical and contemporary debates that now extend well beyond Native America, while noting the specific destruction wrought on indigenous <coughs> systems. So as I mentioned, I'm modifying virgin soil theory, joining scholarship led by historians, anthropologists, and scientists such as Kelton and Jones, who have begun to challenge the common claim that Native Americans die often immediately because they have differences in immunities that make them simply collapse, and collapse very quickly. Don't assume that certain communities are more prone to syndromes and infectious diseases, whether from genetic differences or comparative lack of exposure to specific pathogens. A common suggestion in what's often, or what's previously often been defined as the so-called Columbian Exchange. Notion of genetic predisposition often gets Euro-American settlers kind of off the hook suggesting that abstract biological differences somehow account for population collapse rather than more direct causal interventions, including interventions in indigenous nutritional systems that compromise immunity above and beyond any genetic differences or any differences in terms of inherited immunity. For example, take a look at scholarship on the Black Death in medieval Europe. Scholars are increasingly noting demographic recovery in 100 to 150 years lots of medieval infectious diseases, not just Black Death. But again, that century to 150 years mark is becoming something of a consensus in scholarship, which is showing that the ability to recover in medieval Europe was contingent on adaptations such as sanitation, better land management, better nutrition, less reliance on grains, better animal husbandry, and other contingent factors. So we need to think and refocus our ways on human interventions, particularly food production, and how they've exacerbated demographic decline in the face of disease. Whether in terms of reduced immunity before infection, reduced ability to fight pathogenic invasion, or compromised immunity among subsequent populations, which is an important and overlooked factor. The ability of populations to recover is something that's demographically, in some respects, as important, or even more important, than initial death rates. Indigenous populations, because of the nature of European colonization, are often denied um, the opportunities to adapt, separate from questions of differing immunity. Consider, for example, the meaning of delays in population collapse in South America and the Caribbean after 1492. In the early part of the 20th century, people used to say, Europeans arrive, sneeze, and indigenous people in Peru are gone. Scholarship, not so much anymore. Contingency, colonial disruption. The Inc indigenous people in the Inca Empire, Peru and Central America, if innate immunity differences were important, collapse would have been more immediate, and it's much more protracted, we know, from scholarship. Or consider what we know about Taino and Arawak demography in Hispaniola, one of the first um, islands that Christopher Columbus arrives on. Again, population declines over decades rather than immediately as the um, context and living conditions decline, different from, immune, from notions of immunity, including, interestingly, a sudden reliance on grains imported from Europe that indigenous people in defense of settlements or enslaved in mines are forced to eat, thereby, as one of the many factors, compromising their immunity. Similar paradigm when we consider the so-called proto-historic period, that's the period that historians use to describe those first Spanish expeditions that I guess even in grade school in Florida um, people may have learned about, Hernandez de Soto and those early Spanish um, expeditions in the 1500s. Demographic collapse was not immediate. It takes more than a century after colonial disruption creates a context for which immunity is compromised. So again, this proto-historic period is something that can help us to question that um, paradigm of virgin soils. Okay, now let's rewind further to understand the contingent aspects of immunity, covering some material that some or, or a lot of you may have heard in some of the other great talks that there have been here over the years. The evolutionary interaction between nutrition and immunity from the Paleolithic era to the Neolithic era. To understand the biological effects of nutritional disruption in Native America, 
after 1492, or the ability of communities to recover after initial epidemics, that important factor that I'm trying to reassert. reassert. Consider what we know, but also importantly what we don't yet know, about three vital stages in what I would term human nutritional history. The earliest two stages affect the nature of human evolution. And the first began up to more than two and a half million years ago, when nutrient-dense foods from land mammals allowed an increasingly small human gut to complement an expanding human brain. So some of you will be familiar with the famous expensive tissue hypothesis on the evolutionary interaction between the gut and the brain, which we can use to inform our understanding of the nutritional requirements of optimal immune function and the effect of curtailed nutrition on indigenous lives and other lives also. Alo and Wheeler's famous expensive tissue hypothesis from 62 famously posits that the exceptionally large human brain, along with potentially enhanced cognitive capacity, evolves as a result of an increasingly nutrient-dense diet of animal products, which allows the mass of the digestive organs to decrease, requiring less energy to regulate digestion, energy which could be diverted towards a larger brain and greater brain activity. Let the animal convert grass into nutrients rather than expending energy doing so yourself, and then eat the results, requiring a smaller digestive tract without losing nutrients and while consuming less energy in digestion. Energy that can be diverted to brain function and potentially, I suggest, more optimal immune function. Don't discount all carbs, though. This may be controversial, potentially among some listening today. Some relatively recent work by Hardy et al. has suggested it's not necessary to rule out the consumption of plant carbs during this long extended period in any discussion of the important role of animal meat in the evolution of the brain. Quote, necessary and complementary dietary components in hominin evolution. Discussing work by Conklin, Britton et al. and Rangham, they continue, we shouldn't discount the hypothesis that concentrated starch from plant foods was essential to meet the substantially increased metabolic demands of an enlarged brain and to support successful reproduction and increased aerobic capacity. Immune cells, to be sure, require glucose, either from gluconeogenesis, the conversion of protein to glucose, or from ingested carbohydrates, supporting the notion that starch consumption may have remained potentially important even as animal meats contributed to the enlargement of the brain and the shrinking of the gut. Though this is all still relatively controversial, to say the least, or at least understudied, depending on who you talk to. Consider a second hypothesized evolutionary period, 200K to even as um, late as 90K years ago. Increased omega-3 fatty acids contribute to brain evolution. Evolutionary biologists have suggested the exploitation of marine resources, high in DHA, omega-3, was vital in allowing cerebral expansion as little as 200K years ago, or even more recently, which would have otherwise have been limited by the low levels of DHA potentially available from terrestrial foods. Although, of course, there's a big debate as to how much omega-3 is or is not in land mammals, both historically and today. But these scholars point to the coincidence of the human and brain expansion and increasing reliance on marine foods, as suggested by stable isotope data, which provide abundant um, access to sources of DHA. So our hypothesis, foods connected with the evolution of the brain, many years ago, let's say, likely connected to optimal immune function, given the contiguous evolution of the immune system. And I would just also say, there's still a lot we don't know even about the evolution of the immune system, including the extent to which it continued to evolve and adapt, or even the nature of the divergence between vertebrates and invertebrates before that period. But we're comfortable with, with the suggestion that selective pressures may well have contributed to ongoing refinement of the inflammatory and immunological response during the Paleolithic era, coinciding with the development of the small gut in relation to the large brain including in relation to micronutrient and metabolic requirements for optimal immune function. Leading to a related hypothesis, alter that at any period, chronic inflammation, compromised immunity during the Neolithic era in the quote-unquote old world, and also potentially after European indigenous contact a bit later. So that's an important hypothesis for us to bear in mind. Recall, of course, the Neolithic or so-called Neolithic paradox of European Middle Eastern communities, see 10,000 years ago. Though death rates from infectious diseases 
and potentially even diseases with an inflammatory component, such as cardiovascular disease, likely trended slightly higher in agricultural societies than in Paleolithic communities that preceded them, what we would crudely call hunter-gatherer societies. Increased associated mortality was offset by increased birth rates in agricultural societies. Paradigms that we're all becoming more familiar with. Grains lead to decreased breastfeeding, we think, and potentially worsening immunity, as shown in bone evidence from the Neolithic era. Not just due to greater density of population, where diseases spread more easily in these agricultural settlements, but also potentially diminished immunological health of those living in such settlements, thanks to inflammatory components of grain proteins, decreased necessary micronutrients, increased chronic raised blood sugar, and all that stuff that keeps us up at night. But less birth spacing due to early weaning, so population can mitigate problems in demographic terms. More born, despite declining health of those in the societies where more are being born. And here's some seminal work by Armelagos, Goodman, Jacobs, and others on these very issues. Clark Spencer Larson, important analysis of bones during these, in these regions to help us understand what's going on with this Neolithic quote-unquote paradox. Much new work on grain proteins and compromised immunity in contemporary populations that can help us understand all of that. I'm not going to go, go through all of that. You've heard a lot about that in the, in the past, in this venue and others. But as I said, we must take into account Neolithic adaptation as well in order to understand what goes on or what doesn't go on in the indigenous world. As we've said, in Europe and the Middle East, population numbers can stabilize despite declining health markers. Energy-dense and storable grains can keep people alive up to reproduction, which more depressing biologists tell me is all that nature ever really wants of us. But I think grandparents would have a lot to say about that. Um, the avoidance of starvation up to reproductive age allowed population expansion at the expense of metabolic and immunological health. But these are all gradual enough. So just as we've seen in the medieval period, even in the Neolithic era much earlier, better sanitation, um, animal husbandry, so you can start to farm animals in a way that give you greater micronutrients from, from animals to offset the, the more nutrient poor grains that you're having, and so on. All stuff that we don't necessarily see after colonization, where the context is ruptured. So let's now turn to indigenous North America and look at how pre-European contact, pre contact indigenous strategies were quite nutrient dense, good metabolic health, and prevent zoonotic diseases, the transfer of diseases from animals to humans, something that we see um, increasingly in Neolithic societies. But then there are adaptations to prevent that. How the move towards maize, even before European contact, compromises these strategies in the indigenous world. How the move towards maize pre-contact, on the other hand, has been overemphasized in popular literature, and dare I say, even in US grade schools, we'll learn about beans, corn, maize. Um, how nutritional and immunological problems related to the rise of maize could be mitigated with a pre-contact synthesis between agriculture and hunting-gathering. It would be a fallacy to say that indigenous people either were hunter-gatherers or maize agriculturists. It was a synthesis. And how the sudden arrival of Europeans doesn't allow that synthesis to continue. Let's consider nutrition during the Bering Land Bridge era, 13,500 13, or even 21,000 years ago. The Bering Land Bridge theory suggests a migration across the area between present-day Far Eastern Siberia and Alaska, now covered by the Bering and Chukchi Seas, as lower Ice Age sea levels expose the land. This is what we're talking about here. Sarah Palin was right when she said, you can see Russia from Alaska, because <laughs> um, I can see it right there. Um, and then you've got the Beringian standstill hypothesis, a movement that potentially took place more than 21,000 years ago, but the, the ancestors of modern indigenous people, you could say, are fixed on that landmass far longer than we, used, than we previously thought. And so what, whether they're moving across more quickly or fixed on that landmass, what's the nutrition going on here? Large mammals, protein and fat, in what's been described as a um, shrub tundra refugium, providing a setting for hunted land mammals and woody plants for the burning of bones for fuel, because there's not much 
trees there to burn, but bones being used where trees once would be. Elk, bighorn sheep, many other small mammals. And there's a whole burgeoning art community called Paleo Art, a Beringia, and you can Google this online and see, see stuff like this, which some might like, some might find a bit kitsch. I find it delightful. Um, but that's, that's, that's the, tr traditionally what we've, what we've thought, uh, what we think of as the kind of the land mammals where you're getting lots of protein and so on. Beyond this land bridge theory, we'll see why I think this is important in a second, take into account what's been termed as the coastal migration hypothesis and the importance of omega-3s. Working on this project, researching the evolutionary role of marine DHA rather than me merely land mammals in the move out of Africa and how that might relate to immunity, got me thinking regarding the migration of indigenous people and their ancestors to North America as early as 21,000 years ago. Just as scholars have often ignored the nutritional role of marine littoral migrations in key evolutionary steps that lead to cognitive and maybe immunological development, so migrations which are more, mar uh, more coastal, um, rather than just African savanna, bringing into account DHA-heavy fish. Scholars have also often overlooked um, migrations of ancestors of indigenous people along what's been called a kelp highway, or a kelp superhighway, all the way from what's now um, even parts of Japan, all the way through to Pacific coast of North America. And on these, on these regions, Erlinson and other scholars have shown Movement upon island, island hopping, lots of seaweed, iodine, or iodine, and fish. Here's some of the, uh, the latest work by Erlinson, who's one of the key figures in this, in this um, field. Again, always controversial when you're talking about origin stories. Also, these origin stories don't take into account indigenous mythology as well, which we also need to um, not gloss over. But I'd say we don't need to discount the Beringian land bridge hypothesis or the kelp highway hypothesis. Both, after all, could be contiguous. Some coming along the bridge, others coming along island hopping. I think of the importance of DHA and immunity in all of that anyway. Consider the early work of Cordain on the original paleo diet, where he points out that herbivorous land mammals, historically, um, very historically, um, probably had a lot more omega-3 content to them than those today, given the grain-based diet of many animals. So whether they relied on land mammals during their standstill or marine sources, we see a story here of protein, fat, and probably more DHA than we've thought. All good and important for immunity, we'll see. Let's move to post-bearing migration, 1,300 years ago to 500 years ago, this pre-contact era, which, of course, itself is a loaded term because we're defining indigenous life as pre-contact through the European lens. So there's that caveat we have to take into account as well. Maize intensified 4,000-plus years ago from Mesoamerica back into North America, but more intensified only around 1,000 years ago, especially in southeastern Mississippian cultures. Um, these are some of those cultures that we're talking about. Ancient maize, we should point out, even 1,000 AD maize, far smaller and less glycemic, so slightly less of a threat to metabolic and immunological health, which we'll go on to link in a second, in terms of raised blood sugar known to um, impair immunity, or at least potentially impair immunity, compared to modern corn. So you can really see the difference there between the small ancient maize and what we all enjoy today on July 4th around the barbecue. Big difference. And, it's, and that difference is as you move through time. And you could say the same about many foodstuffs, of course. But it doesn't dominate. It does in some regions, such as Cahokia, incredibly um, advanced set of my, uh, mounds in present-day Missouri that some of you may have visited. Increased maize-centric society, Mississippian culture, um, differentiation, to use a crude anachronism, even class differentiation within the society based on the um, ability to guard maize stores in these famous <coughs> urban mound settings. History and bioarchaeology, bio interestingly, when you put the two together, has shown us that health and immunity in these pre-European contact communities, such as Cahokia, present-day Missouri, as well as the Dixon Mounds in present-day um, Illinois, similar problems to the Neolithic era in the quote-unquote old world. Population growth, when you, when you have those indigenous communities moving towards May-centric society, but decreased birth spacing, 
partly due to early weaning, and energy-rich grains that sustain people to reproductive age, even if lacking essential nutrients, protein, and even if they potentially compromise immunity to diseases. Compromised immunity is offset by increased birth rate. There may even be increased child mortality and maternal mortality, which is offset. So bioarchaeology by scholars such as, such as Larson, the, 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 the methods used in Neolithic sites, I've relied on um, in terms of my reading of similar methods which are used in indigenous sites, such as Cahokia. And bone assessments, such patho um, pathology almost you could say, show a greater propensity for infection by disease in skeletons that have been found amongst communities where there is residual um, isotopic data of grain consumption as distinct from skeletons that are found that likely to have died from natural causes, older, without evidence of grain consumption, and less bone lesions that are a sign of disease. Same stuff that we can see in the Neolithic world as well. And again, I point out, this is not just due, we think, to greater density of living circumstances, but, but diminished nutrients among those communities. They can do amazing things, these bioarchaeologists. That's why I'm not one of them. They can find out the level of B12, the, the level of protein that may or may not have been all from bone analysis. Seminal article on disease and death at the Dr. Dixon's Mounds. Another cheery um, part of this talk on a uh, Thursday afternoon. But as in Neolithic Europe, um, more so in fact, indigenous people are able to adapt and mitigate the consequences of maize while using it as a useful energy source when necessary. Trail mix, you could say, when you're on a hunt, for example. Never total reliance, though, and usually a synthesis between hunting and gathering and agriculture. And it's a gendered synthesis. Women do hard physical labor growing those three sisters, beans, squash, and maize, but let's not overemphasize the maize, often important, but supplemented with other plants and animals, whether it's acorns in, in California and elsewhere, plants, fish, clams, and myriad small and large mammals. In fact, a heightened focus on maize reflects European perceptions often of an indigenous response to the arrival of Europeans, who then unsettle things, forcing indigenous people into defensive settlements. What do you eat when you're in a defensive settlement and you can't go hunting or gathering? Well, you need a storable source of energy to at least keep you alive in that defensive settlement. The English and others see, see this and say, oh, indigenous people have been relying on maize their whole lives. And I'd say something of that discourse, you could say, has found its way even into our elementary school textbooks. Disease in Cahokia and Dixon Mounds, not the norm elsewhere, or even necessarily in those regions after adaptation. Buffer zones are also really important. In different regions, women, as I said, lead horticulture, agriculture, while well, men, sometimes women as well, but mainly men, gain seasonal hunted foods in these uninhabited zones around particular hamlets. Those zones where you get animals from prevent animals from interacting with your plant sources and prevent the kind of zoonotic diseases, animal to human diseases, that you see at the beginnings of the origins of agriculture in the old world, for example. The buffer zones, of course, also provide nutritionally diverse um, micronutrients from animals and gathered foods that likely aid immunity against disease. And after contact, the first thing that indigenous people often can attack, and they would say defensively, as Virginia Anderson and others have shown, is not human beings, it's European livestock. Because they know that it's those domesticated animals that are um, literally putting fences around these buffer zones, but they're also perceived as l being linked to these sudden diseases, zoonotically. Let's now define European indigenous contact in relation to contingent population collapse, discussing micronutrients, metabolic disruption in a bit more detail. We'll focus on Florida uh, after the 16th century, the American Southeast, Southwest, and Northeast, 17th century, Alaska during the 18th and 19th century, and California during those same periods. Those are different periods of what I would call extended European contact. Contact itself is a loaded term. What it means for an indigenous person on the West Coast is different from somebody, say, in the Southwest or the Southeast. If we can detect a decline in health and immunity among pre-contact indigenous people who moved away from their ancestral nutritional traditions, a health decline that reflects Neolithic paradigms, 
it's reasonable to apply a similar hypothesis to the post-contact era when those traditions were uprooted to a far greater extent, whether in relation to hunted animals and proteins or indigenous plant sources. Because, as we've said, European disruption was too sudden to allow adaptation, a centrally important contingent factor above immunity as a biologically immutable factor. Because small percentage effects can lead to demographic collapse. Just like small percentage effects upwardly in a positive direction can lead to demographic growth within 100 to 150 years. Just a small percentage that are affected, for example, by micronutrient deficiencies and their immunity is enough. As Jones has summarized, epidemics that killed so many in such a short time would be dramatic and unprecedented, something that would require remarkable explanations. But substantial losses over the course of a century or even more would not require a special mechanism. A population that loses just 2 to 3% annually will, by the end of a century, have experienced a 90% decline. I'm sure there are demographers and demographic scholars that would probably feel that that statement also needs greater nuance, um, but I won't go into that. Let's turn to some case studies of micronutrient disruption to understand this all and how we might use it to um, understand what this means in our present lives. Here's Florida, immediately before what I would term extended European contact. These are etchings from Jacques Lemoyne de Morgue, an expedition to late 16th century North Florida, before large-scale European contact. So this is the proto-historic period rather than the later period. Animals, fish, non-starchy plants, dispersed settlements, buffer zones. Here's another sort of extraordinary etching. Any animal that could be roasted and eaten was. Though, of course, these etchings can sometimes reflect European stereotypes. We always have to have that caveat. Here we have that gendered um, uh, mechanism that I mentioned, where women are doing highly physical horticulture and agriculture. But this is soon ruptured by the end of the 16th century. Turn to grains, lots of hunted animals, and gathered plants. Clark Spencer Larson has worked a lot on this, linking modern scientific studies to bone analysis in the bioarchaeology of Spanish Florida and the impact of colonialism therein. We can synthesize those assessments of bones with new historical insights about the context that prevented the consumption of stuff like protein, iron, B12 in 17th century Florida. Mass population loss only by the 17th century, as St. Augustine is visited by ships from Havana and Seville, and Spanish missions start to move across native buffer zones and curtail indigenous nutrition. The ability to isolate settlements with, it, with buffer zones and, and remain separate from diseases is at the same time as a move towards nutrient-poor foods, so it's a double whammy. More likelihood for diseases to spread physically, as well as a, a, a decreased access to the kind of nutrients that may have given you a fighting chance, or at least may have given surviving members of, after an epidemic a fighting chance against secondary infections. Corroborated by comparative bone analysis of those who did not encounter such disruption in Florida, i.e. those skeletons don't show evidence of B12 deficiencies, protein malnutrition, etc., and don't show evidence of greater propensity for disease. Decreased iron evident in La Florida bone analysis, a sign of, a great, of greater infection, which uses up iron stores, as well as potentially a lack of iron in the first place. Protein malnutrition, as I mentioned. Much recent literature, particularly among children, on the, on the link between protein malnutrition and a greater propensity to suffer from infectious diseases. We can see this particularly in grain-dominated diets in Africa today. We can see similar evidence in bones of the um, 1700 periods in La Florida. Let's turn to the American Southeast and elsewhere. Magnesium. We all like our magnesium at night. In the southeast, by the 17th century, English livestock are threatening existing agricultural settlements, hunting langers, buffer zones, same story. Matrilineally a focused horticulturalist, so women-centered horticulture, move to Great Plains, and those who remain lose their nutrition. Loss of magnesium sources from sunflowers, pumpkin and squash seeds, beans, greens, leafy vegetables, now, put someone who's interested in ancestral health and talk about magnesium, World War II or World War III will begin, where some will say, no, magnesium's in um, animal products and brains and um, 
liver and, and offal and all that great stuff that we all try and get ourselves to eat. Um, and then they ask somebody with a more, might we say, plant-based perspective will say, no, magnesium's in leafy greens above all else. What you would say to, to the plant-based perspective is potentially yes, but again, today's soil that gives that magnesium, as we all know, is much more degraded. So the, the leafy greens that gave magnesium in, in this indigenous world wouldn't necessarily do so today. So another, another cheery, cheery fact. But whatever the case, it's vital for, as we all know, neurological, immunological, um, cardiovascular, but also vital during pregnancy. Reduces stuff like preeclampsia, preterm births, which would have been a very important factor. If you're a community that's already decimated, what do you want to do? Think of that medieval paradigm of 100 to 150 years. You want to recover. How are you going to recover? Maternal health. You need your magnesium, amongst many other things. So a hypothesis, at least, decreased magnesium may have affected even just a small percentage, enough to tip them over the edge towards maternal mortality. But that's enough in a society where every birth counts in terms of renewing your population. There are, of course, exceptions that we need to take into account. Among many, for example, the Choctaws in the southeast. They're able to actually become raiders rather than um, defend, living in defense of settlements through a whole a Byzantine chain of, chain of events. They're also separated by forests. They carry on their hybrid between hunting and gathering and horticulture. Their demography actually stabilizes or even increases during this contact era. They did come in contact with Europeans, but a sneeze doesn't make them all drop dead immediately. In the American Southwest, Great Plains Basin, consider the importance of semi-essential or even essential amino acids, such as arginine, which are important for immunity. Found in Turkey, historical and anthropological evidence is, of, is beginning to show us that Turkey consumption pre-contact increases in the south, um, southwest. Why, scholars have asked? Well, it mitigates the nutrient poverty of maize, which, in, which increases in the southwest also. So you don't have as much protein and other essential nutrients in maize. So what do indigenous people almost sort of intuitively do? Increase turkey. But turkey consumption declines post 17th century, so you're not going to get your immunity boosted by those essential amino acids, or at least semi-essential. Same with glycine, methionine, drink your bone broth. What else do we have? Folate and population decline. Again, talk about World War II, or three, or four. Get, get somebody who's interested in evolutionary medicine and mention the word beans to them. They'll be, they'll be big trouble. Are beans, are we evolutionary adapted to beans or are we not? Big controversy. But you could say, at least consider this, this, this hypothesis. Bean-centric society, what do we know is in beans? Folate, yes. Folate also, um, highly apparent in organ meats and animals as well. But if you, if you consider folate, in beans and consider a sudden reduction in bean consumption. How is that going to affect fertility, given we know about the importance of folate? Again, a bit like that magnesium example, suddenly losing that access to folate may alter births and birth outcomes. There's a related hypothesis here, a bit similar to that, uh, that Neolithic. Earlier weaning post-contact on purer, sorry, poorer nutritional sources easily ground into pastes that infants without teeth can consume. Again, may have compromised infant immunity, further raising susceptibility to pandemics that are already going on. Consider MTHFR, C677T. Those of us who've done a, a 23andMe test um, and then discovered we have this mutant, I'm homozygous for it, hooray. Um, so potentially my ability to methylate is reduced by 70%, so I'm supposed to have extra folate, um, at least potentially. Big debates on that as well. But if you lose folate and you're an MTHFR sufferer and you have that mutation, which many Native Americans, like many human populations, have got, then you're already compromised in your ability to process folate, which is so necessary in the, methyl in the methylation cycle. Embryo development, detoxification, and even immunity. So those with the mutation are already compromised, and then you're losing even more folate. Sudden loss it may affect maternal fertility, or even those 
in populations who carry the mutation. All the kind of stuff that historians haven't really taken into account in the past, and that they could learn from these insights in, 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 in cutting edge um, biology, genetic analysis, and so on and so forth. Again, there are, other com there are other exceptions that I won't go into of communities such as the Comanche, who are, whose numbers actually go up during the period, and these are communities who aren't threatened in the ways that I've suggested. Again, showing, despite having encountered Europeans, not necessarily likely, that they're not going to just drop dead if they can keep their context relatively similar to pre-contact periods, or even, let's not romanticize this, use European technologies, guns, Spanish horses, in order to hunt even more efficiently than before and gain access to even more nutrient-dense animals or even go on hunting and gathering expeditions to get nutrient-dense plants than has been done before. Back to those omega-3s and immune function. Consider what we know about, about the importance of omega-3s and immunity. Lose access to it, you'll be in trouble. DHA from animal products is probably necessary rather than its precursors, such as ALA in plants, which are less bioavailable. We're increasingly, um, scholars are starting to suggest that that DHA from, mar from marine and other animal products is the one that's most bio bioavailable. Inhibits chronic inflammation, which itself may also um, be related to, well, is, is highly likely related to the acute immune system as well. Omega-3s directly influence immune, immune function. Consider then Alaska in the, 19th, in the 18th and early 19th century. Russians arrive, try and um, uh, feed an insatiable desire for furs, um, otter skins in what's actually the Asian market at that time, as well as other markets. Sudden loss of Inuit diets, um, indigenous diets, which includes a sudden loss of great salmon complexes, huge volumes of salmon that your entire society would have been built around, gone overnight. And you're eating wheat and often alcohol almost immediately. Consider the threat to vitamin D and its association with immune function. Again, we've had, you've had speakers on this before. But consider those who are unable, if you're in a northerly latitude and you're unable to get your D from the sun, you might get it from nutritional sources, such as salmon. Lose that, lose that immunologically important micronutrient. Loss of land animals would also lead to a lack of D, particularly those organ meats. You can note the particularly high level of D3 in beef liver and kidney versus muscle meat. Lots more could be said about D, immune function, and so, so on and so forth. But let's now move beyond micronutrients in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, um, to talk about micronutrient disrupt disruption to met metabolics, the way that energy is or is not used in the body. Decreased fasting, higher carb diet. How is that a potential contingent factor in understanding indigenous loss, but also how, what can we learn from this ourselves? So that sudden move to maize wheat in these different contexts. The relative availability or preponderance of macronutrients, most commonly fatty acids and carbs, may act as a limiting factor in certain immune cell functions. Endocrine signaling pathways can sense micro macronutrient availability, such as the relative availability of um, glucose or fatty acids in the blood, and can communicate like little magic things to the immune system to affect the immune response. Nutrient sensing pathways, including those involving insulin, have been shown to alter the activity of immune cells. Increased insulin levels in sudden high carb potentially decreases immunity to pathogens by disrupting uh, or dysregulating these pathways. Fat cells are known to secrete pro-inflammatory mo molecules and potentially, some research is showing, also affect um, the immune system and its, and its working. Hyperglycemia, for example, has been suggested to increase chronic inflammation as well as decrease immunity to pathogens. And again, think of these defensive settlements that I mentioned. People who are used to a, a, a very moving, a movable lifestyle suddenly bunkering down and eating maize at the same time. It's a double whammy of effects in terms of metabolic health. Back to those omega-3s. Don't just treat omega-3s as a micronutrient. It also likely has a metabolic role um, 
in terms of maintaining insulin sensitivity. So if you are having that slightly greater amount of carbs, a bit of DHA might at least help you process it a bit more, potentially, although we may be overstating that. But it's certainly necessary to ma maintain metabolic regularity, re maintain insulin sensitivity. Eberson and colleagues show an inverse relationship between plasma insulin levels and plasma omega-3. So if we have the hypothesis that chronically raised insulin is a metabolically problematic state, which will reduce your immunity to infectious diseases, then reducing your amount of DHA will also be a problem. It's a double whammy, as I've suggested. It may also reduce fertility, given the literature on blood glucose levels and syndromes such as PCOS and others. Again, that contingent factor. Also consider the hypothesis that disruptions to the seasonal balance between carbs in summer and higher protein fat in winter potentially compromises indigenous immunity and fertility. So you have these winter hunts, which are then suddenly curtailed. During those winter hunts, the hypothesis is that many indigenous communities may have been fat adapted, more reliant on a, on a metabolism using fatty acids rather than glucose. In summer, potentially, gluco um, uh, a carb-centric carb metabolism may have been more likely. Of course, there's a lot of new research suggesting greater insulin sensitivity, to cut a very long story short, when it's extra sunny. So maybe a little bit more carbs, but again, I could just be getting very excited with one paper and completely overstepping the mark there. Um, but again, general hypothesis, curtailed hunts may have prevented a period in time when indigenous people had a, a higher protein, higher fat diet, lowering your insulin, potentially to the benefit of immunity, but also, mainly for men, but not just for men, prevented periods when naturally you would have gone for long, extended periods without eating. That, that, that notion of a long hunt, and then you gorge afterwards. It's a paradigm, it's a global paradigm. Long periods of non-eating, and then quite a lot in a short period of time. That's something that may be beneficial for immunity, given what we know about autophagy which may have originated as a metabolic control pathway that allows cellular survival in response stresses such as starvation. The role of autophagy in eliminating pathogens is thought to have arisen later as one of the earliest antimicrobial defense systems. The process, the cellular self-cleansing process, breaks down and recycles damaged molecules and cellular organelles, including creating new immune cells, occurs when blood glucose levels are low leading to another hypothesis. Decreasing levels of autophagy among communities who suddenly rely on maize, less long, fewer long hunts, with fewer instances of fasting, may decrease immunity. Starvation, lower calorie and nutrient intake, may initially enhance immunity, given what we know about autophagy. It mitigates the problems caused by micronutrient deficiency when you fast, by upregulating your immunity, potentially, an evolutionary adaptation. But curtailed nutrient density, combined with increased grain consumption, prevents autophagy, that fasted state where, we, where our cells can be cleaned up, create new immune cells, as well as reducing necessary micronutrient intake during this period of disruption. And in the last sort of three or four minutes, can we define disrupted ketosis? as a contingent factor compromising indigenous community. In this forum, I ain't giving you a definition of ketosis because I know um, it's, a, it's a speciality of the forum. But just to know, that, that, that period where we, a greater burning of fat from exogenous or endogenous sources during low carb construct, um, consumption and the state of ketosis, ketones in, in the blood, usually um, produced by the liver. Therapeutic effects we know, potentially also enhancing the effectiveness of the innate immune response. So consider these periods of, of hunting, or these winter periods where you're eating more protein and certainly more fat. They're, they may have been more likely to be periods, at least, of seasonal um, metabolism of fatty acids ketone or keto and or ketones rather than glucose. Disrupt that state. You may disrupt the association between enhanced immunity, and a ketogenic metabolic state. 
though not necessarily ketosis per se, in communities such as the Inuit, big literature, which I'm not scientifically adept enough to decipher, um, Nicola is, my research partner, historically genetic mutations and other factors may, some scholars say, may more, make it more accurate to describe fatty acid oxidation separate from the traditional definition of ketosis, but I'm not going there. Much controversy in the literature. But we can certainly say that disruption to a state of potentially greater reliance on ketones, fatty acids, problematic. And then finally, think of the microbiome itself, the sexy topic that everyone's interested in now, or the bugs inside your gut. It's a lovely thing to think about. Disruption to the optimal fuel source for gut bacteria by colonization could be defined as a related contingent factor in our discussion. Whether it's, whether it's fatty acids or particular types of starches, whatever those things are, and there's a big debate there, and how they relate to the microbiome, the balance that is optimal may have been disrupted by nutritional disruption. So disruption to that which causes um, optimal gut metabolism, and, the, and more specifically, the um, creepy crawlies in the gut, may be an important factor. That which affects the gut microbiome can be defined as a contingent factor historically that we need to take into account. Even what we're, we're, we're increasingly calling resistant starch, which is linked to the microbiome. Stuff like acorns, when you grind them down, you get acorn powder, which is often defined as a resistant, resistant starch. Acorn complexes around which communities in California were often based, and elsewhere, which were suddenly lost after colonization. You get it from acorn powder, but also from ground up plants, rhizomes, roots, tubers, which contains something known as inulin, oli oligofructose, a non-fermentable carb, classed as often as fructans. They're stored in the roots and the tubers. It can't necessarily be digested by the human digestive system, but it's still potentially necessary. Some studies have confirmed that it passes through, undigested, kind of a prebiotic, providing a fuel source to the bacteria. So get rid of that, may, in some contexts, where it's become useful for indigenous people, be one final example of something that alters that which has previously led to a, a, an association between nutritional intake and sound working immunity. So what can we take from all of this in the last couple of minutes? This, this discussion of contingency and immunity. Are we all in an age of autoimmunity? It's of course important to avoid what might seem like egregious um, comparisons between the problematic health effects of the modern food pyramid. I come from the University of Minnesota, the home of Ansel Keys, um, Mr. Food Pyramid, as it were. And the, but it, it, may, it may be egregious to make a, a connection between that and the horrific decimation of Native Americans due to the combination of newly introduced diseases um, and compromised immunity and fertility, which of course was, was exacerbated by the, the violence of colonization. But there are salient associations that we can take from all of this, which can inform both contemporary Native American health strategies as well as all of ours, for those of us who are not indigenous, struggling with compromised metabolic health, nutritional status, and immunity. These diseases of civilization that we are starting to define as deriving from a mismatch between what were evolved over hundreds of thousands, millions of years to require in our guts, where a lot of our immune cells are, and what we're getting, things that are inflammatory, but things that also don't, don't um, give us the micronutrients necessary for the immune system, or that lead to a metabolic state that itself is, is associated with poor um, metabolics. Whether inside or outside Native America, dysregulated immunity and compromised health has in some respects become internalized. After a European contact, we've said, it's about the acute immune, re the acute immune response, the ability to respond to outside pathogens. But today we've got antibiotics, let's hope they continue working, vaccines that reduce the danger of infectious disease. But autoimmunity has become a chief determinant of poor health and mortality. The body's internal immune response, chronically overactive, inflammation, following nutritional and metabolic derangement, among other things, leading it to kind of attack its own tissues and hormonal pathways in a very crude way of describing the situation.
diabetes, heart disease, all linked to this, as we all, as we're all beginning to know. Yet policymakers and researchers in those same health services often respond to these conditions reactively rather than proactively, as if they were solely genetically determined rather than arising due to external nutritional factors and other environmental factors that result from that evolutionary mismatch. A similarly problematic pattern of analysis, as we've noted, has led scholars to ignore the central role of nutritional change in Native American population after European contact, focusing instead on purportedly immutable genetic differences above all else in these contexts. Thank you for listening today. So we'll take a few minutes for questions. But first of all, I would like to, this is a lovely purse that was so cute, I'd love to have it, but probably not what's in it. Um, so whoever's purse, this is this your, your purse? Yeah, just want to make sure you have this, so y'all can pass that back. OK, so we're going to open this to a few minutes of questions. Um, and we'll talk, OK, I have one here and one here. I got you, OK? In uh, relation to um, how humans have a relative large brain for their size, I had seen a TED Talk that hypothesized that the reason was because we discovered fire and cook our food, so more calories are bioavailable. From what I can read, um, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, right? So, that, so some of the consensus that I've seen, again, caveat, no expert, I'm standing on the shoulders of other people for all this information to synthesize it, is that that ability for greater technical know-how somehow is, co is contiguous with or follows and then can be a mutually reinforcing mechanism. You then get the, you get more stuff, which then reinforces your ability to get the micronutrients and so on and so forth. But I think from what I've seen, I'd be interested to see the, to see the paper, um, that cognitive ability is linked to the prior arrival of those foodstuffs that allow it. But I'm happy to be proved wrong. Yeah, I, I want, I'd like to see the citation. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if there is evidence for or against your hypotheses from other colonization events from, with isolated populations. Uh, I'm thinking maybe about Australia, Polynesia, yeah. Hawaii. Do those fit into your pattern or something else? Even, and you have to be careful here, white people in early Virginia. So the story of, of early American history begins with the Puritans, right? Freedom, city upon the hill. But the first colony, as we all know, is Jamestown, which is a story of mass death. It's a story of mass white death as well. Those first poor indentured servants, black and white, um, they will die, and, and we can see that their death is contingent on whether or not they were living next to a malarial swamp or not, whether or not their nutrition declined. Um, those who lived in a fancier house and were away from all of it didn't, despite potentially being exposed to similar pathogens. Other, um, other regions, um, in, 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 of course, during the Neolithic era, you can see, so the, the Asian move towards rice. You can see similar patterns of bone analysis, although it's a bit more difficult um, given the moisture and context. Um, Hawaii is its own, uh, and Polynesia, again, has its own literature on contact that does, from what I can tell, tell a relatively similar, a relatively similar story. Um, Aboriginal, um, Aboriginal life, um, definite decimation, but from what I can tell, less to do with um, diseases and more to do with real destruction. Yeah. Understanding is that in most people in the field of evolutionary medicine feel that the, the increased risk of autoimmune disorders is mainly related to the lack of early exposures to microorganisms. In your last slides, you seem to suggest that maybe the nutritional, the lack of micronutrients may play a bigger role. Uh, so I just want to, yeah, so to that, comment that, on that. That, that. that dirty soil hypothesis where we're not enough, we're not playing in the, in the mud enough, or just, there aren't enough microbes in the mud full stop because it's, it's far too sterile now. Um, yeah, so a lack of exposure to, pr to prior um, uh, microbes and so forth. But again, I think it's um, the two things, I don't see why, why there's a dichotomy between the two. You can have a lack of, an ex of exposure to enough 
dirty stuff to prime your immune system in youth. Um, and if you don't get that, then you're going to get a more autoimmune diseases. But I think people are starting to say it's not just because kids are washing their hands more that this is going on. It's uh, a lot more to it. It's, it's micronutrients, it's stress, it's lack of sunshine, it's metabolic derangement, big one. Um, so I th I, my reading is that um, uh, dirt hypothesis is being added to by a host of other factors now vis-a-vis -vis vis -vis how the microbiome works, what's contributing to it, and more generally, um, immunity. But yeah, I hadn't included that one, I should have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are there any indigenous populations? I know that there aren't many left, yeah. but are there any uh, existing that are undergoing these uh, food transfer formations that can be studied Absolutely. to test these well, hypotheses? So I actually, t the title for the book, Decolonizing the Diet, is taken from um, uh, there are movements, in the Great Lakes, for example, there's the decolonizing the diet movement. There's um, a man in Minneapolis who's known as the, uh, the, the sous chef. He's actually opened up a restaurant uh, with an, uh, indigenous nutrition. And these are often of appropriately um, indigenous-led initiatives um, to go back to the history, look at what was eaten, which, and then men, some indigenous people um, had assumed that it was all maize. And then they find, hang on, there was a whole diverse set of plants and animals here that were being consumed. And the initial results in these initiatives, there's one at um, University in Michigan that's been carried out by students and faculty themselves. Health conditions, I hate to, over, to at the risk of overstatement, are, can change within months. And we're talking stuff here like metabolic syndromes, metabolic dysregulation, um, even mood disorders. Um, can change when, 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 you, when you can move back to um, that ancestral nutrition. But of course we would say ancestral nutrition differs from one indigenous population to another, so we shouldn't just use a broad brush stroke. But there are, there are all sorts of movements now in Canada and the, and the US. Um, some of them are inspired by, I guess you could call, the paleo diet, to go back to what, what their ancestral diet are. And some are inspired by their own indigenous diet themselves. And you even have paleo Native American um, movements growing up particularly in California as well. Yeah. You hear a lot of push to eat grass-fed meat. Yeah. Are there any nutrients in that soil? Well, that? yeah, um, the topic of our soil, I know you've had um, esteemed speakers on soil health, um, another depressing thing. Um, yeah, well, the more, the more grass there are, the more likely it will be an ecologically um, more optimal environment than one where the soil is bare and it's just, you know, chemicals on the soil, as it were. But yes, um, I've been in several arguments as to whether or not there, are, there is or isn't, whether the extent of more omega-3s in grass-fed meat than in non-grass-fed. And many people who know more about this have told me that there's more omega-3s in grass-fed meat where the meat is fed on, from, from the grass. I've had others tell me, eh, don't exaggerate this or go too far with it. Any beef will do to get your B12 or whatever. Um, who knows what the vested interests are in either of these, um, either of these situations. I know, for me, non-grass-fed beef is tastier, um, but maybe not more quote-unquote healthy because the omega-3 and the various other micronutrients that are, that are in the, the grass-fed. But yeah, people say the grass-fed one is more evolutionarily optimal, shall we say, yeah. Hi, I have a question. Um, what are your thoughts on, can you hear me? Yes. What are your thoughts on um, the consumption of eating whole foods versus eating genetically modified foods and processed foods and its effect on the immune system? Well, yeah, there's the, there's the general notion that if you eat whole, whole foods rather than the stuff in the middle of the supermarket, you'll, you'll, you'll do well. That's actually something that, in, that indigenous people have been, have been looking at. There was a... The, the, the food pyramid that, that, te that um, comes about during the, the, the 60s and 70s, even earlier, has an effect on reservation communities because the, 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 the food welfare initiatives that come through that, it's often the non-whole foods, it's often processed stuff, seed oils, grains, the stuff that we're starting to think may not be that healthy. And that, you, that's definitely associated with a whole lot of... Um, greater propensity for infectious diseases, but also these metabolic syndromes and autoimmune diseases from what you ingest. Um, so there is a notion that eating the bean whole or the animal whole 
depending on whether your perspective is more plant-based or animal-centric. Animal um, uh, you'll get the micronutrients to a greater extent than when you refine it. And again, if you look at the, the refining of foods, if we can talk about that, in the indigenous world, the grinding down of maize, when you're not eating it whole, what are you doing? Well, it's far more highly glycemic. It will raise your, your insulin even more than before. But it will also have a, a, a lot of um, knock-on effects, like the gruel, for example, that's given to, to babies. That's not necessarily nutritionally um, optimal, um, but which can lead to decreased breastfeeding and more, uh, less space between births. So you may be having um, refined foods, what, the kind of stuff that we'd have in packages today, but four or five hundred years ago would be stuff that you would grind in a pestle and mortar that wouldn't be quote unquote whole, can have a whole sort of set of knock-on effects and allow easy, easy options. But again, as a man, I'm not going to stand here and talk about easy options for a mother because that would be egregious in its own way. And this, this is all choices that people make on their own terms given their context. Yeah. And easier to talk about individual health, but we're moving into an age where our climate is going to be changing rapidly and our food sources are going to be changing rapidly. Um, as we have to synthesize more and more of our global food sources, what do you recommend? That's a horrible And how do, you, how do you see the effects on future populations, it's even just secondary to the food sources? It's a hard question. So we have our population number, however many billions it is now, and we've got the agricultural revolution to thank, or not to thank, depending on your, on your perspective for that. So grains have contributed to getting to this high population that we see, getting people to reproductive age as opposed to optimal health. So now we're at, this at that position, I guess you could say it's all well and good for me from a privileged position to say we need to have salmon and omega-3 fats. But if the whole world then moves to salmon and omega-3 fats, we can't all live like Japan if we do. So we're in a bit of a catch-22 where grains have gotten us to this population, and so we need lots of smart people to work out how we're going to get that DHA, not just from fish. We need some smart synthesis going on here. And you could say the same about many other micronutrients. My own personal position would be movements to more localized food, mixture of animals and plants in the same place. But again, I was asked myself, is that from a position of privilege that I'm making that supposition? Is it possible? Will that lead to many people dying and not reaching reproductive age? Now that we've got the numbers that we've got from grains, micronutriently poor, but they've gotten that population number, how do we mitigate it? Will mitigating it be unsustainable? That's a question of the ages and of this age. Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, there's other questions, I'll but um, uh, maybe you can catch up. Um, I want to thank you all again. We want to thank Dr. Mailer. It was awesome. And I wish you all a very happy and safe summer, and we will see you back here in September. Okay.